Good. Well, it's three o'clock, uh, so why don't we go ahead and get started? I'm really glad to welcome Dan Meyer and Audrey Waters here for uh, episode six, discussing chapter five of the Failure to Disrupt Virtual Book Club. That's the problem with having a prologue in your book is that your um, book club uh, episodes get offset from the chapter numbers. Um, for those of you who are just arriving, um, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know who you are and where you're from and what the weather is where you are and uh, anything else you wanna let us know about your connection to this topic. Um, and uh, very pleased today to um, introduce Dan Meyer, um, who is a longtime online interlocutor of mine and has been very generous uh, sharing his time with, uh, um, with audiences that I've connected with in various ways. And he's the chief academic officer at, at Desmos. Um, which provides an uh, online graphing calculator, but then also uh, much, much more. Um, so Dan, thanks so much for joining us. And can you can you introduce yourself to us um, with an ed tech story? Can you introduce yourself to us with some encounter that you had um, as a learner, as a teacher earlier in, in your career with education technology to, um, to, to give us a sense of who you are and where you're coming from? Yeah, this will um, you know this will this will date me, but also set kind of the the groundwork for where I'm at in ed tech. First of all, uh, thanks for having me on, um, Justin and Audrey, a couple of my favorite thinkers and talkers about all of this. It's just an honor to be here. Um, I'm honored to see a couple of my, my Desmos colleagues online. I'm here, you know, representing much more work than just my own, um, although all all errors and omissions are mine. So um, the biggest deal for me in ed tech was when I got a digital projector in a classroom. I went in a grant actually applied for it. It was not standard equipment. Um, so that's my era of teaching. And um, what was just what, fantastic what about uh, 2006, I got the, I got the device, I think. Yeah. And uh, I really want, I did not want to be a math teacher. I wanted to be a movie director and was kind of oblivious to like how difficult that transition would be career-wise. Um, but I really had a, a facility and an interest in uh, images and visuals and, and found that in, in math class even, they were useful to stimulate student thought and interest. And so I, all of a sudden I was no longer printing out full color transparencies, but I was like creating uh, like, like movies of uh, math as I saw it in the world and bring that in not to like just kind of show and tell the math, um, but to have students engage in the mathematical analysis with me. Like, um, you know, here's me at a, at, a, at a shopping market, you know, which line should I choose? And just kind of bringing students into the scene. Uh, and that was just, that was just so huge for me. Um, continuing a little bit forward to where we met, I was in, I went to Stanford to study math education um, in grad school. That was around 2010 and y'all know what happened in 2010, right? Everyone, everyone kind of knows like that era that, that, that started there um, with, with MOOCs uh, oriented, epicentered at, um, in the Silicon Valley particularly Coursera. And I was there with the math education department. We were watching the engineers and computer science folks, just like it was just blowing up without any of our input. Like if we had organized the biggest campaign to like say, hey, like this kind of pedagogy, we've seen this for decades in online instruction. Um, this is just bigger, but it's definitely not better. And it's not going to work in lots of ways. If we'd organized the most massive concentrated campaign, it would not have stopped the, the venture capital powered rocket ship that was taking off right around us right there. And we were all kinds of sour about it, um, or at least I was kind of annoyed at how popular these folks over here who had not paid their dues in the classroom or these k-12 classes and um, that, that was that was a moment for me where, where I just I saw that and um, you know other other kinds of innovations Khan Academy came up around then also um, we got a Khan Academy uh, software developer on the call so I'll um, uh, speak gently here about Khan Academy but it, it represented a way of, of learning that was not one that I had any use for in my class um, th this like watch some watch a knowledgeable adult tell you what you should know, and then repeat that back through multiple choice and numerical response items. Um, just it didn't represent any kind of experience I was having with students that was, I was so enthralled with. Um, so that, that was like my development. Um, and then subsequent to that, I met um, through Audrey. Thanks, Audrey. Um, Eli Lubroff, the CEO at Desmos, who at that time they'd created a very fantastic and powerful um, graphing calculator, which was web-based. Um, it was free for end users funded by, as, as Justin mentioned in the book, funded by um, partnerships with assessment consortia and companies. And that early success there, we kind of parlayed that into funding for a project around uh, more integrated experiences in math classes. Like we saw um, teachers using our calculator to have students solve problems that we didn't 
like all that much. Like it was kind of like, oh, okay, that's a nice use for this, but we wanted to have a, a more integrated impact into um, using ed tech into a student's math experience. And that's led us to create um, a core mathematical curriculum. That's a, that's a kind of blow by blow there, uh, moment by, by moment. Um, I think I should, somewhere in there, me and Justin, like we led a contest to kind of critique in video form, Khan Academy videos, that was a blast. Um, and that's where kind of our partnership really Reach some kind of zenith or a local maximum. I'm not sure if we're, we're done blossom. yet. That's where it blossomed, but the, yeah, blossom, the fruits and pollen have spread so far, <laughs> so far beyond. Um, no, that's great, Dan. Will you say just a little bit more? Because I think it's important too that you were a classroom teacher of math for a number of years in there too. I guess you said that with your, um, but what, what, what grades and what subjects did you teach? Yeah, that number was uh, six, six years. Um, so th that six years was. Um, I don't think qualifies me in a lot of ways as like a real teacher. I feel like less and less connected to my identity as a teacher over time, but it was enough to give me certain very valuable experiences in the world of ed tech. Um, and I taught high school mathematics, um, public schools, um, mostly ninth grade, definitely as is the custom for lots of new teachers, novice teachers, uh, that I received the students who were neediest and need, needed the best kinds of instruction, which is um, a sad state of affairs. But um, I would just say about that, that I. I really love mathematics, saw a lot of personal value in my own life, like just personal experience. Um, and it really bothered me in ways I am glad I couldn't shake that students did not like what I liked. Like I'm the sort of person who recommends you a movie or a TV show. And if you don't like it, that I want to kind of get to the heart of that, figure out what, where, where we're missing each other. Um, I felt the same way about students in math class. And that was that dissonance, like, wait, you don't love this stuff, even a fraction of my love for it, Pro just provided you know, it was cold fusion for my creative efforts. It was like, you know, a uh, perpetual motion machine. It was rocket fuel for all, all my work subsequent. That's great. So we brought Dan here today to talk with us about the curse of the familiar. So in the second half of failure to disrupt, um, I argue that there are four as yet intractable dilemmas. If you want to understand sort of why education technology has not taken off in the way that many people often hope, if you want to understand what the sort of persistent barriers to success and impact and scale and other kinds of things you might care about, um, then, you know, I argue that these four things you got to look at, which we're going to tackle over the course of the next few weeks, the curse of the familiar, the ed tech Matthew effect, the trap of routine assessment, um, and the toxic power of data and experiment. Um, and Audrey and Dan, Audrey, maybe we can start with you just to give us all some shared grounding. And in case there are folks who joined us that didn't have a chance to um, to, <laughs> to read the chapter, um, could, you, could you give us your sort of take on what the curse of the familiar is and um, what seems to make sense to you about it and what's, what's missing? I think that, um... I'll let, I'll let Dan speak to the, to the parts about Desmos, but one of the um, things that you talked about here that uh, I thought was um, how I often think about this as well is the, the popularity, the widespread popularity of Quizlet. Um, almost everyone I talk to who's not in education or ed tech knows Quizlet, uses Quizlet. Um, it's incredibly popular and it's, it's a digital flashcard app, right? So, um, it's a company that's raised a substantial amount of money, um, probably downloaded on, <laughs> it's probably one of the most popular ed tech apps, um, but is it transformative, right? Or I, mean, I think as you say, you might be able to do things with a digital flashcard app that paper is more challenging to do with. Uh, so there's perhaps there's more efficiency there, but is a digital flashcard app going to be, um, is it going to be transformative or really is it, is it even going to, you know, sort of to use a cliche, move the needle in a, in a substantive, in a substantive way. And sometimes, how I, sometimes my joke is something like if you gathered a bunch of educational experts from around the world and put them in a room together, like would anyone raise their hand and say, we have a real dearth of flashcards in our nation's school systems. And until we can address that dearth of flashcards, we're just never going to be able to move forward. Like flashcards is the things that we're really missing in our schools. But, but that's, but that's, I think the, the curse of the familiar though, is that, you know, I think that that's, that's part of the thing is that when we, many of us, when we think about how do we study, um, how do we, um, how are we going to best sort of organize our notes for our classes or material that we have to learn? Um, because of our own even analog experiences, right? We, we think, ah, I 
should get some flashcards. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then by contrast, when we try to do weird things, we try to do things that look really different. If we tried to, um, you know, make you memorize facts in some kind of new way that you have never seen before, which might even be better. Um, then those things often end up being confusing to people. That when we develop new technologies, um, you know, we talked, we alluded to this and talked about it a little bit. We talked with Mitch Resnick and Natalie Rusk about Scratch. Um, there's a lot that's amazing about Scratch, but I do think there are a lot of people that encounter that interface initially, and they go, "I don't know what this thing is. Like, this doesn't like where is where is the puzzle? I'm supposed to have a computer programming puzzle, um, or I'm supposed to have like a list of things that I copy into uh, you know a, a computer programming environment, and that's how I learned a computer program. I don't I don't know about all this, you know." cats and sprites and dragging things around and stuff like that. Um, and there's a lot of people, you know, there, I think there are very few people who hit the Quizlet website um, and go, I don't know what this thing is. They go, oh yeah, no, that's the front of the flashcard. That's where the question goes. That's the back of the class. That's where the answer goes and off we run. Um, whereas I think, you know, we build things that are really new and really different. Some of the games that we talked about um, with uh, Scott Osterweil and Constance Steinkohler last week, you know, a teacher might play the logical journey of the Zubinis and then say, well, this is really cool, but I have no idea exactly what's teaching kids or how it would fit into my uh, um, um, experience. Um, F. Noss joins it. He was in an AP prep class this weekend where the instructor used a Desmos activity that consisted entirely of scanned worksheets and just used Desmos to collect the answers. Um, so even as people are trying to do things that might be really different, um, we also take tools and we figure out the sort of most familiar ways to use them. Another way I say this sometimes, I think it's in the book, um, is that, you know, in, in 30 years of education technology history, uh, the a per, a finding that we find over and over again is that when teachers have access to new technologies, they use it to extend existing practices. There are, very, there are very few teachers who will tell you a story like Dan told you 10 minutes ago of, I got a projector and the projector allowed me to, to do many different kinds of things in my teaching, especially initially. It's much more common to say, um, I got a projector and now I put my notes up on the projector that I used to put on my overhead acetate. I don't know, how does this ring for you, Dan? Um, does, this, does this seem like a framework for thinking about this problem that resonates or are there parts of it that, that are, that's, that's missing or, or could be more complex or nuanced or? Yeah, this is, a, a, I think, I had, the, I had the most challenges with some of your analysis of, of well, we'll get to, get to some of my, my questions about your analysis. I thought that the part that was just really rang true for me was that ed tech is a, a, a place where you are um, either going to combat or co-opt uh, the grammar of schooling, as it's called. Like that's either going to work against you or in your favor. And part of the advantage of uh, for us of hiring a team of teachers, myself included, former teachers, a very large team relative to the size of the whole company, um, especially compared to other ed tech companies. We have like, um, I don't know, 15 former teachers. We have former teachers on the engineering team. Is that we're a group that really understands the grammar of schooling. And what that means for us is that we are um, able to, um, we, we're making decisions about what about that grammar do we want to change, subvert, and what parts do we not care about, and which parts will we actually like preserve and co-opt. Um, that's been, th those three areas are just so hard to understand if you don't have time, if you haven't spent 180 days of a year, time six periods, understanding like what the bell is telling you to do every every hour and what what kind of the logic of what students expect is. Um, so yeah, so for, from our perspective, for us, we, we are not trying to subvert the school day. We're not trying to get learning outside of the four walls of a classroom. We're not trying to, uh, you know, upend schooling and turn everyone into homeschoolers. Um, so like those are, I'm not judging those necessarily, but I'm just saying we know what we're not trying to do. Um, and we are, we are actually really eager to use the four walls. We understand that there are things that are possible when a, a bunch of people are together in a room um, that are impossible during asynchronous experiences. There's this collect, Durkheim's collective effervescence. It's why we go to, used to go to movie theaters or why like sports are interesting to watch in person versus on TV. It's that bubbly champagne-like feeling when you're all together. So we know what we're trying to change and not trying to change. And I'll just tell you what we want to change is the following. We want to change a student's relationship to mathematics and a teacher's relationship to students. And we're going to do that through the oldest cliche, the oldest device in the book, a math curriculum. Like we, we believe in a coherent um, approach to student experiences where teachers aren't trying to cobble it together from scratch every day. And we'll use that to, to change what we want to change. 
So here, I mean, here's an interesting puzzle of what you've said, Dan, which is, you know, and the one that you described sort of the core of your company is we want to change a student's relationship to math and a teacher's relationship to students. Um, and step one of Desmos in that process was to build a graphing, an online graphing calculator. Um, you know, that, that, I mean, that might strike some people as not the most intuitive way um, to go to changing relationships um, is to build an online graphing calculator. How, how, does, how, do, how do you carry us across that uh, conceptual bridge? Yeah, I think that that, that was part of why Desmos, the co-founders, uh, Eli Lubroff and Eric Berger, decided to hire on people who under, bring on collaborators who understood the world of education a little bit better. Like that group, under, they, they understood technology and, uh, and and kind of the way devices were, like those were used in classes. But th there was a certain limit that they hit in terms of like, what is our understanding of the grammar of schooling? We know that these devices get lots of uses on use on tests and in classes. Can we build a better one, a cheaper one, one that's more dynamic and enables more exploration. But in terms of what, how are those explorations structured in a school day, in a school year, um, that was something that, that they, we, all of us needed to bring on lots of different collaborators. I just wanna share briefly and I'll describe it for the folks who are listening um, you know, later on, like what, what the difference is here so it's not so abstract. Um, Typically, like in math ed tech, and I'll use Khan Academy as a, as a go-to um, for, for all my critiques. They are free and easy to access in a web browser right away. So they wind up being the, the source of a lot of my critiques. Um, so like right here, the, the question is, you know, how, how do you write a linear equation out of this context right here? And so if I'm a student, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I often will just like grab numbers and like, I know that a linear equation takes the form of like Y equal, like something X plus something. So I'll grab the four from the problem, 32 from the problem. And it says, no, give it another shot. Um, let's me get, um, see, see an explanation or some step-by-step. -step. I can keep on going. Um, I don't, is it four? Let's see, six X, uh, six X maybe, is that it? Not quite yet. Anyway, this is how Khan Academy approaches this. This is common of a lot of math ed tech, which is like type in a very structured kind of uh, math input. And we'll tell you if you are right or wrong with no nuance in between. Um, and so in our version here, um, of a similar kind of mathematics, we start, and this is, this is again, using, using computers to engage. And, um, you know, like the, you play this right here and it, it almost doesn't feel like mathematics initially because we are engaging your mathematical um, brilliance on a, on a more sensory level, visually, intuitively. We'll ask students to write a story about what they saw here. And some students will be very factual, like, you know, turtle, uh, one turtle uh, was slower and had a head start or that, that kind of thing. We've seen students, though, who have written some very lengthy, um, epic uh, tomes, uh, stories about it. Like one student really got into his cultural background as a, a Japanese student and wrote this kind of like epic about the caste system, uh, you know, occupied by these two different turtles and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it kind of moves on here. And what we love is the ability to, to not tell a student that they're right or wrong, but just to reinterpret um, their mathematical thinking into the context itself. So an example of that um, you just saw would be right here where we ask students to write an equation and D, I'll write like D equals 10 T minus, I don't just type in numbers here. And what this lets me do is um, see, see my mathematics in the context without judgment as right or wrong. Um, this enables students to experience math as, creative and ideally connected. I can try like, I don't know, what, what, if I switch these around 4T plus 10, I can start playing around with things. Um, and okay, that's interesting. That head start was 10, turtles moving faster. What happens if I do a negative slope? Does that work? What does that do for me here? Um, oh, slick, the turtle moves backwards. Anyway, this is our use of, of technology to support students in experiencing math as creative uh, and connected. So I have uh, I have two thoughts in the book about how to move past the curse of the familiar. But before we move forward, Dan, you said that you had some questions. Were some were some things around the framing of that that you wanted to raise as potential issues that were worth discussing more? Well, you made a lot out of community as being part of the vehicle of like successful um, education technology, and you, you referenced a number of moments of like your and my even shared history on in online spaces and how we've experienced community there. I think community has enormous value, of course, um, for lots of things. But I just couldn't quite figure out like um, Khan Academy has been, by some measures, very successful, certainly in terms of um, you know time magazine covers, they are ahead of Desmos for now. Um, Coursera, uh, in terms of venture capital, very successful. Um, 
Uh, and none of which, none of those, neither of those, I would say, have a community attached to them. Certainly not in math educator circles. Um, and so I, I don't know, like I, I, I struggled to connect the success of, an edu of education technology to community the way you did. And I was hoping you would, you would speak to those examples in particular or, or help me kind of flesh out what you were saying. Yeah, I, I think what I was saying is that uh, a space that I'm interested in are how do you get, how do you get technologies that are widely adopted um, that also help people meet the kinds of goals you described before, which is changing the relationship between students and math, changing the relationship between teachers and students. Um, how, do you, how do you get widely adopted technologies that also ask people to do pedagogically different kinds of things? Um, so what, you know, the, 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 you know, as we were talking about before, Audrey's example of Quizlet, um, the best way to get a technology widely adopted is to not ask people to do teaching and learning differently. Um, to ask them to do the same kinds of things that they were doing before, to have a high degree of familiarity. Um, and if that's your approach, if you, don't need, if you don't need students and teachers to learn any kinds of new routines or any kinds of new patterns, um, then really you just have to worry about scaling as widely as possible. Um, and uh, um, you can actually think about scale sort of solely as a distribution problem. Like how many people know about Khan Academy or Coursera? How many people log in? Um, how many people operate it in a way, you know, trusting that to participate in Khan Academy, you don't have to sort of rethink teaching and learning. I mean, one of the things I bring up in the beginning of the book is Saul Khan had this 2019 interview with District Administrator Magazine, um, where he says, you know, for a while I talked about kind of rearranging, you know, using technology to rearrange schools, to be a lever to project-based learning. But what we're seeing now is that basically um, uh, people should teach normally four days a week and then use Khan Academy for practice problems one day a week. Um, and that's sort of doable and achievable. Um, so that I think, I don't think it requires community or you know, even a great deal of, of uh, pedagogical creativity to implement those kinds of models. Um, it, it mostly requires dissemination. Like if we get enough computers in schools and we make you know, um, the, the, the web service good enough, then, then that's pretty easy. But what happens if you, you know, for, for someone to use the tools that you just showed us, um, where you ask people to play around with a mathematical model with really abstract representations and then to like slowly make that more concrete by adding more um, mathematical notation to it and things like that. You kind of have to, you have to think a little bit differently about teaching and learning. You can't think about math teaching and learning as, well, I'm gonna lecture to you for a bit about how to do a problem and then you're gonna practice using that on a different set of numbers. Um, to, you can't, I, don't, I don't think Desmos will be able to scale those ideas just by getting people to download Desmos. Um, if, if we want those kinds of ideas about teaching and learning to change, then you have to have a community of educators, um, mathematics educators, who are willing to say, not only, hey, here, come see Desmos, but like, come see Desmos and let me show you some lesson plans that might look different from what you're doing before. And here's where you're gonna get stuck on those lesson plans. And here's where it's gonna be frustrating. And here's where you might need more time. And here's where, where you might need to change the schedule. Here's where you're gonna to need to change the routine. Um, and here's how I can convince you person to person that these different kinds of ideas are gonna be better. Um, you know, so I guess I, you know, I have this theory that um, the, 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 the most interesting pedagogical ideas that you all as software developers have tried to bake into Desmos are not gonna be transmitted by the software itself. Um, there's gonna have to be um, the building of a community of educators that sort of math teacher to math teacher, department head to department head um, share these ideas, which is, you know, and the reason why you and I know each other is because we encounter each other um, doing this kind of work where you've given talks in all 50 states. Um, you have this whole cohort of Desmos um, teacher educators, you know, you like, like built, you know, the way, the, the only, the only, one of the only ways I see through the curse of the familiar is this kind of community building. You know, we, we had uh, Natalie Rusk and Mitch Resnick on recently, and I see Scratch doing the same kind of thing. Like you can, you can get schools to download Scratch and then they take it and they do exactly what Natalie and Mitch don't want people to do with it, um, which is just to like, you know, give people recipes for problem, you know, for programs they're supposed to make. And it's only when you have, you know, teachers engaged with these communities of folks um, that you can have something that both 
looks like you know change that's happening in thousands of schools or tens of thousands of schools, um, but also sort of a real meaningful shift in practice. Audrey, that's the argument any, anyway. Yeah, um, can you add any more color to that, Audrey? What's your take here? Um, you know, I, I was thinking a couple of different things while you were talking. Um, and one of the that's why I ran on so long. I needed to give you some time to. <laughs> Well, one of, one of the things that that also I think that you don't really talk about here, Justin, when the curse of the familiar is I think the, the power of an influence of investors who also have their ideas of the ways in which um, ways in which ed tech should look, but also the metrics that matter to them. Um, you know, and I think, I think that the, one of the things, I mean, there's, there are many things that I love about, about Desmos, um, but I think one of the, one of the things that I adore is, um, well, it's Eli, the CEO, but is the way in which I think that a lot of the decisions that Eli makes are not the decisions that look good for the investors, right? Because I think there are ways in which, um, you know, typically, for example, the more clicks you have on things that you can sort of show your investors these charts that say, you know, last month uh, people clicked 800 times and this month we got them clicking 1600 times, therefore, it's improved. And I think that, you know, I think that the curse of the familiar really does also shape the way in, lo in which lots of these other, um, other softwares, other educational software gets designed and it gets designed to meet the, the familiar uh, that investors expect as well. And I think that that's a really, it's a really powerful, it's a really powerful force um, on the ground within education companies. That reminds me of uh, Justin's line in the chapter. I think it was something like uh, ed tech needs patient optimists. And I think that like patient optimists describes very few uh, venture capitalists, you know, in our world uh, who are more often like, you know, anticipating, you know, 10 failures for every one success and are looking at a three or maybe five year timeline. And uh, we have uh, largely through Eli's guidance and uh, others at the company, been very uh, chosen some very fantastic partners here and there, especially those those recently at, at Reach Capital. Um, yeah, I don't know, uh, Justin. I'm still I'm still struggling a little bit here. I think um, I think that the uh, community that people most experience in teaching is not online. Like most teachers are not the very online sorts, you know, yep. who are here in the chat right now. I was like, oh, we should survey. The teachers in the chat right now, and I was like, "Oh no, these people aren't normal. These are these are uh, these are my kind of weirdo." Um, but most teachers aren't online, and most teachers, their community is local. It's in their department, um, if that. And um, so, I would say, I would, I would. We have a community of Desmos fellows, invitation only, about forty per year. And I'll just say, we do not invite them to disseminate. Like they are not our disseminators. They wind up doing a lot of that just because they we all get along really well. Um, but they are there to help us. Um, test and validate and kind of purify our notions of what education is, especially for um, populations of students that like we, we, I as a white male educator don't have experience with, or I, I don't understand their experience of math education. Um, I, I think that personally what, what we need is for students, what they call low floor, high ceiling math tasks, where like any student can kind of enter in and write their story about the two turtles. And then the ceiling goes higher and higher and you can write long stories. You, then you go to the equations. And what, what's so missing from ambitious math ed tech or ed tech at, uh, in general, I, that's the distinction I, was, I see you making between like ones that fundamentally try to change something, um, is that there aren't like low floor, high ceiling teacher tasks. Like Scratch just asks you to kind of, as far as I understand it, like really just reimagine math instruction, CS instruction, what CS is, what, a, what, an, IDE, what an IDE looks like all of that. And there's just like not a great way to jump into that at a low floor. Um, and when you talk about like narrow foyers, that to me feels like trying to create that low floor. Um, and so ideally for us at Desmos, I would trade so much of our dissemination in exchange for an imagination for experiences that were alluring to teachers of all sorts that got them in the door. And they just felt that onrush of community with their and connection to their students like, oh, this is like, I'm not, my students don't hate math and don't hate me today. Like, this is awesome. And, and then we can scale that up. And like, as they're ready for it, we have, you know, our snapshots tool and our feedback tool. And um, that's what I'm looking, I need a better imagination for in my work. How, um, I mean, I think the thing that you're describing there 
is is something that I tried to describe in the book is sort of the second pathway through the curse of the familiar, which is can you give people something that's familiar enough? Or I use the term familiar, you use the term low floor, and they might not be exactly the same thing, um, but they might have some overlap that you can sort of walk into this task and be like, yeah, I can do this. Um, this is this is not so cockamamie and so different that I'm just completely lost and going to turn this down. Um, but it's, but, you know, it's, it's, it's helping me meet some of the math goals that, you know, have already have historically been assigned to me by my district, by my state, those kinds of things. Um, but it's also helping me do that plus other things. I mean, how much do you feel like Desmos is trying to, you know, meet teachers where they're at in terms of um, the, the, the goals that are already embedded in their curriculum, the, um, the, the patterns of the grammar of schooling they're used to seeing, and then kind of take them um, and say, actually, we could do some of those things, but we'll probably have to give up some of those things so that we can do these other much cooler kinds of things. I mean, does that resonate with you as a set of goals that you have or? Yeah, I mean, you open up our curriculum, it's digital, so that's different and new, and we're, we're ready to accept that cost. Um, but it has like a chapter listing, it has a lesson listing within chapters, like there are elements of it that feel very familiar, it's, it's aligned to standards, you know, like we have either accepted those costs reluctantly, or in some cases, eagerly, like we're happy to be called a curriculum, we think that those are valuable and oftentimes the, the drivers of teacher growth is when the PD is attached to a curriculum. So we're happy about that. Um, and the difference is, is that instead of saying like, turn to page 233, number 2021, 20, um, you know, you press, press the assign lesson button and then this facilitation interface opens up and that's where we're like, okay, now we need to start stretching you a little bit. But up until that point, we're hoping this feels, to use your word, very familiar. Um, Audrey, we've talked about this before about, um, trying, you know, the, ch the chapter has examples, and Dan, we can ask you this too, the chapter has examples of Desmos and Scratch as these sort of two pieces of education technology that seem to be, you know, have some success in reaching a certain amount of scale in schools, um, engaging public education in interesting ways, while also trying to change what teaching and learning looks like, um, whether or not Dan agrees with me, I sort of say that, you know, they do this through kind of building and spreading community, um, and then through creating materials that start you somewhere familiar and get you somewhere else. Um, can, can you think of other, what, what, like, what else could have, been, what else could have been the examples in this chapter? What else should have been on our list? This is like the trick question. <laughs> I get this. I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I, um, Desmos is, Desmos is always my go-to example of, of, um, good, the good ed tech, the ed tech I like. Um, I think it's, I mean, I think that it's, it really is indicative though of how, how much, uh, um, how much ed tech, despite all of the talk of disruption is really, um, replicating, um, not just replicating systems, um, but replicating, I think some pretty, um, some pretty awful practices. I think that lately, um, I'm sure that people have seen like the sort of explosion of the um, surveillance software used to monitor um, monitor people, um, monitor students who, um, in case they're cheating. And uh, I just think that you know what we what we see more often are things are, are that are, there are software that just sort of are the worst of are the worst of it. Um, Susan's proposing GeoGebra and IXL as other options. Um, I actually don't know IXL that well, although I think of it as kind of a practice a problem platform. Um, GeoGebra is something that I think of as kind of a, a precursor of, uh, um, of Desmos in certain kinds of ways. Um, I can't even think of another, you know, I mean, part, my sense, and Dan can correct this, is that part of what insulates Desmos from investor pressure is probably a certain amount of, um, you know, deeply held beliefs from um, the founders and so forth. But it also struck me that like part of what insulates them is that they found this funding model that doesn't require um, 
you know, individual consumer purchases um, that you, that you like, I assume that I don't know anything about Desmos finances, except I have this sense that you get like these lump sum payments um, from publishers and from testing consortium um, that pay a, a reasonable portion of those bills. Um, and uh, um, what that allows is sort of a longer runway, you know, you're, 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 not necessarily as judged on like how many user acquisitions do we get in the fourth quarter of 2020 um, in the same way that many other education technologies does. I mean, it seems like that kind of relationship is not that different from the relationships that like, you know, the lifelong kindergarten lab has with the National Science Foundation or other kinds of things like that, that you have these sort of like, not perfect, but like semi-reliable chunks of institutional funding um, that give you some freedom to maneuver. I can't even think of other companies that have sort of similar, you know, I, I can think of a lot of university-based things that have similar funding structures. I can't think of a lot of other um, sort of for-profit for technology companies that have a source of funding that ends up, that ends up working to, to insulate them against certain kinds of, you know, uh, financial pressures related to like getting individual consumers to participate. Yet yeah, I'll just offer two follow-up comments to that. One is yes, um, Desmos has been uh, before I arrived. This was, was uh, enormously conservative and shrewd uh, about how it funded itself um, in the model, exactly as you described, by getting some like relatively chunky, lumpy, large, large payments from publishers and um, assessment consortia. And that wound up like my team at Desmos that gave us like uh, on the teaching team Desmos. Uh, like five years to just play around with different kind of models for ed tech and to pilot and to think and to throw away. It was just ridiculous, like the, how spoiled the teaching team was at Desmos is. Um, and only now that we're starting to sell into districts um, with kind of this like smaller, but much more diffuse and uh, regular sales, are we like starting to see that, that my team is uh, gonna, gonna start earning its keep basically here at Desmos. Um, so there's that. And I would also just say, yeah, like we, um, like uh, the founders, the like, and I include myself as one of the more influential early employees there. Like, have a, a fair, like, are, are driven by concerns beyond like flipping a startup to you know to Google or Amazon or someone and getting bought out. Um, like, we have certain ethical positions that are articulated and rearticulated um, to everyone in the company. And eventually, most recently, like we've created a, a committee, the Equity Steering Committee, which um, has more codified those beliefs about what learning is and the context in which students learn to the degree that they are you know, empowered to say, no, we're not pursuing that project. Um, this partnership is not gonna be um, productive for students or, or you know, just for students. Um, we're trying to like formalize as our company grows beyond like out beyond the kind of the nucleus of these, these early people who had strong ideas so that it can continue as a 50, 100, 200 you know, and beyond kind of company um, and still preserve those ethical considerations, which have, yeah, have insulated us from people who wanna partner with us, who wanna fund us and so on. Dan, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of things, um, and you can be, use a real example or it could be hypothetical, but the kinds of things that um, features or things that you would say no to, right? What, are, what is something that, like, I even say, like, many, because it's of the curse of the familiar, teachers want, yeah. but you're yes. like, nah, we ain't going to yeah. do that. Yeah, uh, there's, there's a current very big one in the era of, you know, disaster, pandemic teaching, and... Um, Basically, we have we have our curriculum that we build using tools that we make available to teachers to use themselves. Like there are very few of our tool set that's you know restricted to our employees, and so teachers can create these activities. And one of the commenters in the chat here said, "Yeah, I saw like someone use um, Desmos to display an image of a page and then collect you know student responses digitally, which you know isn't nothing, but it's, it, I think we agree it's not transformative." So anyway, we have those tools, and we have seen in the era of virtual teaching um, just an explosion, as so many people have, you know, so many companies companies have in the usage of those tools. And with that comes an influx of teachers who are, you know, not part of the crowd that we have reached out to and tried to, you know, seduce into our orbit. There's like, there's people who are desperate, you know, and they, they're importing lots of ideas about teaching that haven't gone through our, you know, hype cycle or whatever. So the biggest feature request we have received over the last, you know, nine months, um, six months, six, nine months is for auto grading, for more auto grading. Our software by design, we have not exposed to students 
whether they are right or wrong. A, 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 in the same way that say Khan Academy says like, try again. Um, and that's been intentional because for our, our activities, if we tell a student you're right, then thinking stops. If we tell them they're wrong, thinking may continue but of a certain character where they're like, like I did, just try different numbers and press submit until I get the, get the, you know, the hooray. Um, so we display this to teachers the correctness or incorrectness of their students on some items. Um, and that lets teachers create conversations that connect students and develop thinking. The more coy a teacher can play um, and not revealing the correct answer, the more thinking and justification and authority is transferred to students. Anyway, people want to display a green check or a red X or a thumbs up image or a thumbs down image to their students when um, their answers are right or wrong. And we've heard that and we, we are so plugged into the teaching community. Um, you know, through through Twitter and other other means, and we are responsive. And we, when they hurt, we hurt. Like we were former teachers, and yes. we want to do right by them. And um, there's been like even some like intercompany debate, uh, intercompany debate about whether we should create the means through which teachers can display that auto feedback. And um, that's an example where when you know what you're about, then you have a better platform on which to make those decisions. And so we've decided not to do that, but instead to invest ourselves in creating other kinds of technology that gets at that, that, that um, responds to that same need, but also preserves the student's creativity and connection to other students. An example of which might be, instead of student does this problem and we say right or wrong, uh, we let you see, peek in on another student's screen and respond to that student to a prompt. Like, do you have a question for the student? What do you like about the student's work? And then jump back to your own. Um, but that's just like how, that's how um, an ethic is manifest through technology. I, that's such a great question, Audrey, of what is the thing that you're not willing to build? Because I, I, it it's a question we could have asked Natalie and Mitch too. And I think they would have had similar kinds of answers of, you know, folks are often trying to get blank, but we just, you know, and I think it would have been about assessment too, very likely. Um, Kathy Fletcher, who's from OpenStax, um, asked a question earlier, which is, uh, Dan, it seems like when you're reframing math as creative, you'll run into problem that assessment is focused on a very different type of problem. Have you cracked that nut? Um, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, the, when, when you're, you know, when the kind of math that you're advocating for intersects with the formal assessment system, how are you in, in Kathy's terms trying to crack that nut? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't find it difficult to create experiences for students that replicate more operational, traditional math questions you see in assessments. Like our curriculum, for instance, has a practice section. No one, I think, in our, in our curriculum would, would say it is the strongest part or the most distinctively us part of the curriculum. But we do have that in the experiences that students have, you know, where they are practice, creating lots of different equations and watching the turtles do their thing. Like that all prepares them to answer a single operational question of the sort that you saw in Khan Academy. Um, and I would also say that we're, we are working closely with assessment consortia um, around the world, domestically, internationally, to um, rethink what assessment looks like. Which would be people um, like Smarter Balance and uh, um, the, the, mo the more East Coast one. Um, Park. Um, I don't know how partnered up we, we we have our our calculator is embedded as a problem solving tool on lots of different assessments in like over half the U.S. states. Um, but I more mean like actually creating assessment items. Like we have mm -hmm. um, partnerships with certain countries. I'm not sure I'm able to name um, that. Like we, to actually design items that look like that turtle, for instance. And um, we've been surprised happily at how interested lots of folks are at rethinking what assessments look like. Yeah, I mean, I think that could be another one that that maybe didn't make it on the on the list in the book. But one of the ways to make things more familiar in schools is to make them more familiar in standardized assessment systems. Assuming these are things that uh, are not going to be just wished away, um, and, and and there are a number of organizations that have advocated for that. You know, um, the Hewlett Foundation for a long time. This will connect to assessment too. Um, was advocates. I think they still have some folks who are. The Gates Foundation does too of trying to get better essay auto graders. Um, that if you had more essays that were automatically evaluated, then um, in ways that teachers thought were good, um, then teachers would assign more essays to their students because they would know that there would be more writing that showed up in uh, in standardized tests. And you could sort of um, shift the shift the grammar of schooling by yanking on the, the assessment lever that often feels quite powerful. Um, and, and you know, and then I, I think. 
they, they ran into some political problems with that project, like lots of teachers saying, actually, we don't want to teach our students to write um, for the purposes of, of having things graded by machines. Um, but I also think they ran into technical problems, which was like, these tools are just not very good. Um, and you can write really bad essays that get graded really well. Um, and you can write really good essays that get auto graded really poorly. Um, which I think, you know, and, and they had, and they had very smart people working on those things for a, a very long period of time. And they, and, you know, they still are. Um, it's one of these areas in which technical progress seems to be, uh, seems to be quite difficult. Yeah. You, you folks both have your books about, uh, ed tech, you know, coming out in Audrey's case or out in Justin's case. I think my, my own summary will be, you know, whenever I write, it would be titled just not very good would be kind of the, <laughs> the summary of math ed tech throughout history. In spite yeah, of the promises. I think I you know, it's, it's, it's both not very good. And for certain things, it's like still best in class relative to other kinds of things. Like if you, if you were to, if I make a list of technologies that are useful to people during the pandemic, um, the list is pretty short, but one of the things that is sort of leapt up in my rankings in the last nine months is like gamified math ed tech for K through five, um, sort of dream box, uh, some of those other kinds of things, which I think relative to in-person instruction is pretty poor. Um, but I think relative to remote instruction for kindergartners um, is actually pretty good. Um, you know, if, if, we want, if we want kids making some progress in math um, when they're like really not able to operate video conferencing software and their parents not able to superintend them, um, you know, th th those are tools. Um, and I, and I, and I, you know, and I, I think I say that as a, um, you know, someone who tries to study these things. And I also say them as a parent um, who, who's, you know, most of the math learning my kids have done over the last nine months have been in Dreambox. Good. Well, we're coming to our um, 350 uh, time here, which we, we try to end 10 minutes early in, in respect to the, the very few MIT students that we have join us every week. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions that I missed from the chat that we should try to get as we're um, winding down here. I got I got one on uh, assessment there. Um, uh, Yuliana asked us, uh, speaking about technology and pedagogy, do you support the opinion that instructors who fail to teach well remotely are not well qualified in pedagogy? such as those colleagues who lecture and Zoom to the black squares as students have their cameras and mics off, having no interactive activities and any students feedback. Um, I don't know, Audrey if, or Dan, if you have any thoughts on this, but my, my experience is that there's some like really outstanding teachers who are really struggling to teach well right now. Um, um, and in fact, uh, some of the very best sort of pedagogies that out there are really hard to replicate online. We, we, did, some we did some research over the summer um, where we interviewed 40 teachers. One of the teachers we interviewed um, is sort of known as like the singing math teacher. Um, she's an elementary school teacher, which has this great repertoire of sort of call and response songs for teaching math. Um, and she was just broken hearted because they all kind of fall flat on Zoom. Um, you, you know, it, it, turned, it turns out that like, you know, it's kind of hard to, to, to discern all of the interactions that work on Zoom and don't work on Zoom, but call and response is definitely one of them that doesn't work. Um, even you know, though it's- at the beginning, Dan talked about the, the, the effervescence of the classroom. And I think it's about the teaching, but it is also just that being, a, being with a group of people. And I think it, for me, I'm always, it always reminds me of sort of the danger of personalized learning in which everyone is just interacting with their, you know, <laughs> with their computer, with their Dreambox software and not engaged in the other part of community, which is the students, the students as, a, as an intellectual community working and interacting with each other. And I feel like that's, that's the, that is so difficult to, to recreate, um, even with, you know, even with video conferencing. Um, it's just, it's just not the same to have these little squares. And so, if, you know, th there's a lot to be said about teaching, but I think there's just a lot to be said too about just the reciprocity, the intellectual reciprocity that students have in a classroom. That's just, it, we just, it's just hard to do. Yeah, if I, if you show me a teacher who is doing well in this current model of instruction, I'm gonna want to like get that person, you know, tested for performance enhancing drugs. Like they, I don't know how anyone's doing anything effectively right now, and so I'm not inclined to judge anybody who's struggling. Um, yeah, it's just a tough time. It is a tough time, but I know that there are a lot of folks who are out there. I mean, we we run a, as you've joined us, we have a little cohort of uh, Boston Public Schools math teachers that we're supporting, um, and I feel like one of the 
um, you know, one, one of the very few, there are not many silver linings of the pandemic is that there are going to be some teachers who tried some things um, during the pandemic that worked a little bit better for them and they're going to be able to bring back into their classrooms, um, you know, when we hopefully get to safer and happier times. Well, I know that collective effervescence is almost impossible to generate on a video conference call, but I think we did the very best we could to generate a, a simulacra of collective effervescence um, during this call. So Dan uh, Myers uh, from Desmos, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really great to have you. Thank you, folks. It's a treat. Thank Take care. You, Audrey, once again, for uh, co-hosting this uh, with me. Thank you. So we will be back next week discussing the EdTech Matthew effect with Antero Garcia, terrific teacher from uh, Stanford University, formerly taught in the Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, and uh, more great conversations to follow. I think in the next week or so, we're going to have the first podcast release of the book club. So if any of you missed some of the earlier episodes, they're, they're going to start coming out in processed form uh, now. Um, anyway, thanks everyone for a great discussion. Um, and we'll see you all uh, around this time next week.